Hi everyone, I'm going to be reading off this report that I just wrote on the effect of constant rate factor on the quality of YouTube videos. If you'd like to read this article for yourself instead of watching it in video form, I'll have a link to it as well as a link to the data that it's based on in the description. So sorry if this sounds a little bit kind of formal since I'm just reading off something that I already wrote, but I figure I explained it best when I wrote this, so might as well just read it. This report is my attempt to study the relationship between compression, recompression, and the final video quality once a video is uploaded to YouTube. For my use case of recording gameplay footage with OBS, editing and rendering in Adobe Premiere, and finally uploading to YouTube, each video is compressed three times before the end user sees it. In the past, I've done basic tests to see how compression settings in OBS affect the video quality of the resulting files from OBS, but that only tests how they look after one compression. It stands to reason that when the video is compressed three times in total, once by OBS and then Adobe Premiere and then YouTube, the video quality of the first or second compression might not be as important as you think. Specifically, I want to make an informed choice about what quality I should compress my files to so I can minimize CPU usage and file size without having a noticeable impact on the final video once uploaded to YouTube. I'm going to give enough methodology info just so that you can understand what the data actually means, and if you're interested in the more detailed notes of the methodology, then check out the bottom of the article. So to start, in OBS, the first time the video actually gets compressed, I record at 1440p 60fps using the constant rate factor compression type on the super fast preset. And it's important to know what constant rate factor actually means, so this value ranges from 0 to 51 and the value represents a certain video quality that the encoder will try to maintain, and it will use almost any bitrate that it can to achieve that quality. This leads to very consistent video quality and highly variable bitrate, and a CRF of 0 is lossless, and CRF of 51 is extremely terrible, you should never use it. Reasonable values in terms of file size and quality are around 20. I tested CRF values from 15 to 25, at 15, just subjectively, I can just barely notice compression artifacts in the video. At a CRF of 25, compression is totally unacceptable to me. Just to give you an idea of what they look like at the two extreme ends of the reasonable values of 15 to 25. A lower CRF means higher quality videos, but significantly bigger file sizes. Ideally, you want the CRF to be as high as possible, that is, the lowest quality possible, without having an effect on the YouTube video quality so that you can reduce file size. So next part in the production chain for me, after OPS, I take the video into Premiere, and there I render it at 1440p 60fps, but instead of CRF I use a variable bitrate, 2-pass, and when you see me say that I compressed it to 30-60 megabits per second, um, that means this first number is the target bitrate in Premiere, and this number is the maximum bitrate in Premiere. Instead of just relying on subjective comparisons of looking at images to judge the quality, I wanted something quantitative, and I found it. So I quantitatively measure the quality of a 395 frame 1440p 60fps video encoded to various CRFs and variable bit rates. And I measured this quantitatively using the Visual Information Fidelity pixel domain version algorithm. There are many algorithms for measuring video quality, this seemed to be the most accurate one that my chosen tool supported, and VIF is also utilized by Netflix to some degree, so I trust that it's probably pretty accurate. Let's look at the data, and I'll take you through how to read it. And as it says here, the Excel file containing the graph and data, plus some reference images and batch files, if you want to try to replicate this data yourself, will be included in a zip file linked at the bottom of the article, and in the description of this video as well. Let's get comfortable with how to read this graph. The y-axis here is the average VIFP, or Visual Information Fidelity, pixel domain value. A distinct VIFP value is generated for each frame in the 395 frames per video, so that's why it's an average. It's averaging the VIFP value of all 395 frames. The x-axis is the CRF that I started with in OBS, and I put OBS in quotes, because in reality I used FFmpeg on a lossless version of my video file to simulate an OBS recording. This allowed me to compress the exact same video in all cases. Without the exact same video, I wouldn't be able to use VIFP. VIFP compares each compressed video against the lossless recording, so it needs to be exact. 
So what do the VIFP values on the y-axis actually mean? Well, they range from 0 to 1, with 1 being no quality loss at all. 1 would be the value for all frames if you compared the lossless recording against itself. Let's start with the orange bars. Those show the VIFP values of the exact same video being encoded to CRFs ranging from 15 to 25 and then uploaded to YouTube. That means each video has been encoded twice, once by my OBS simulation, FFmpeg, and then once again by YouTube. This skips the third compression of Premiere entirely, which isn't realistic for my use case since I make all videos with an editor, so there's a third compression, but I did it just for curiosity's sake. As we can see with the orange bars, as we go to the right, that is, as the CRF increases, the VIFP value goes down. So as CRF increases, the visual quality goes down, which is exactly what we would expect because a higher CRF value equals a more compressed file. The yellow and green bars show realistic workflows where the video is compressed three times. The yellow one has a target bitrate of 24 megabits per second when compressed by Premiere, and the green one was compressed to 30 megabits per second. And just a small aside, the yellow test, which was done at 24 megabits per second, um, 24 megabits per second is not an arbitrary value. That's actually what YouTube recommends for 1440p high FPS videos. So I consider the 24 to be the normal quality. And then the other test where I did 30 megabits per second is more like an extra high quality. Something interesting about these results for the yellow and green tests is how much lower they are in VIFP values than the FFmpeg to YouTube tests. Just simply being compressed three times instead of two times seems to have made a fairly big difference to the VIFP value, even if you were compressing to a rather high bitrate of 30 megabits per second. I'm not sure how high the bitrate would have to be to make this third compression have no effect on the final quality, but it's probably something extremely high and unreasonable. Also, Notice how the difference between VIFP values for all tests with a CRF of 15 to 18 are very small. Um, as in, if you go from CRF 15 to CRF 16, the VIFP value doesn't change very much. But if you go from CRF 24 to 25, it changes quite a bit more. This is indicating that the difference between videos with low CRFs is being covered up by YouTube's aggressive compression. This completely makes sense to me. YouTube is compressing these videos to a much lower quality than what a CRF of around 15 achieves. So it makes sense that the greater the quality divide between YouTube and your source video, the less significant source quality becomes. Let's look more into how fast VIFP values are changing at the various CRF values. The alternative axis that you see here at the top and the right hand side show the percent change between the last VIFP value and the current one. So for example, the red bar on the top left right here shows that the VIFP values went down by about 1% between the last value over here and this one. If the relationship between starting CRF and the final quality was linear, the percent change would stay consistent. For example, if the quality went down by 1% when raising the CRF by 1%, it would continue to be 1% for every one of these percent change results. The fact that the percent change increases as you reach lower CRFs indicates that the closer you are to YouTube's quality, the more effect your choice of CRF has. So now we know more about how quality changes in relation to CRF. We know that it's best to avoid low CRFs because quality quickly drops, but to really make solid decisions from this data, I think it's important to know how these VIFP values map to perceived quality. For example, what does a VIFP of 0.42 actually look like? Here's a video showing a quality comparison between the exact same frame in a video of CRF values from 15 to 25, corresponding to the green test on the graph, the one that's been encoded three times and has been encoded at 30 megabits per second in Premiere. Now, just subjectively, if you look at this from the start to the end, I think where the quality starts to turn over and become noticeably worse is right about at a CRF of 20. So if we go back here, look at this brick wall. This is obviously very zoomed in, by the way. If you'd like the unzoomed in images for your own comparisons, 
Um, those are in the zip file that I've linked to at the bottom of this video and in the article. So look what happens to this brick wall. Right now it's fairly detailed. Now that it's at 19, still fairly detailed. And look what happens when it turns to 20. It becomes noticeably blurrier. A lot of the bricks just disappear and then it just gets worse from there. It gets significantly blurrier after that. So it seems to turn right at about 20. So just from a visual inspection, I would say a CRF of 19 seems to be a quality that's right on the cusp of the quality becoming unacceptably bad, in my opinion. To translate that back to the graph in a useful way, so the one that I determined was right on the cusp was the green test, and at a CRF of 19. So I looked at the VIFP value of it right here, which is 0 0.367304, and I just made a flat line right there. And this line means that anything at this VIFP value or above should be as least as good as the example that we just looked at, the green test with CRF of 19. This gives me actionable information. The quality of the green test at CRF 19, this one right here that the arrow is pointing to, is about the same quality as the yellow test at CRF 17. They're both right about at the same value. So since I've determined this CRF is my minimum acceptable quality, that gives me these two options. Now I can decide on the trade-offs between these two because they have different properties. This yellow bar here with the CRF of 17 was compressed at 24-60 megabits per second. And this equates to a bigger source file because our CRF is lower, meaning a higher quality file. It means smaller rendered files because it's higher quality at the start, but then lower quality when it's rendered out in Premiere. And that equates to less upload bandwidth needed. On the other hand, this green one at CRF 19 is a lower quality source file but a higher quality render in Premiere, which equates to a smaller source file, but bigger rendered files and more upload bandwidth needed. Based on this data and my own preferences, I'm going to go with a CRF of 19 and a higher rendered bitrate because it will allow me to keep my source files around longer because the source files will be smaller. But I also know that if I run into my bandwidth cap with my ISP, I can always switch to this one, which will then use less bandwidth when I go to upload my videos to YouTube. So I've come up with two informed options that I can choose between depending on the situation. I hope you found this information useful. If you're interested in similar questions, but this data doesn't fit your use case, I have information below on the methodology and tools used so you can gather your own data. Here's the methodology and detailed notes. I'm not going to read them in this video. You can check out the article if you want to look at this or just pause the video, I suppose. And I'll link the article in the description of this video. I do want to point out that these are the tools that I used. So I give you the exact tools and the exact build that I used for them with links to download them. And I also have a link to a zip file here, and this link will also be in the description so you don't have to copy it from this video. And this zip file contains things like the Excel file for all the data and the results and the graph as well as many other things, such as all the graphs and a bunch of images, which I suppose you probably wouldn't need if you have access to the Excel file, but it's there. The quality comparison video that I just showed you. Uh, just a thing showing the recommended bit rates from YouTube. There's also a link to that in the article. Also the full size uh, quality comparison images taken from YouTube. And there's also some batch files that I've included here that you can adapt to your own use. I use these or, or variants of them to convert many files at once to all the different formats that I needed to use. Saves you on a lot of tedium. Thanks for watching.